I'm Nina van Tilburg for Biz News. Dr. Tiens Ierloff is the former executive director of the F.W. de Klerk Foundation and a former vice chancellor of Northwest University, and he's known as a reconciler and a negotiator. He has come out against the Basic Education Amendment Bill, saying it is a bitter attack on Afrikaans' education. He has also called on South Africans to cross the ANC Rubicon, saying that the once powerful liberation movement has shriveled into a gang of corrupt villains and that it's time for political change. Dr. Yellow, that's quite a mouthful. Welcome to Biz News. Thanks, Luna. Can we start about that statement you made about time for South Africans to cross the Rubicon? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, the, the ANC has been in power for almost 30 years. Um, and they've they've had a a good run at it, uh, and they've basically buggered it up. Uh, that that's a short version. The, the the longer version, perhaps, is that although there had been some some gains in the early years of our democracy, um, in the even in the early days of Tabo Beki's uh, presidency, uh, and obviously then Jacob Zuma and after him Sir Ramaphosa, things has just gone from from bad to worse. Uh, many of the of the things we associate with the bad things in South Africa, we blame on Zuma, and, and you know he has a lot to to answer for. But some of the things um, started happening already in the in the Mbeki era, and I'm thinking here specifically cater deployment. I'm thinking racial transformation, uh, and and all and and black economic empowerment, uh, and 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 hey, it gone wrong. Uh, with Zuma, he took those things uh, to a high level, as as we know. Uh, and, and unfortunately, with uh, President Ramaphosa coming in, first as leader of the ANC and then as, as uh, president of South Africa, we had all hoped that he would he would act decisively uh, with leadership. And for whatever reason, it's still mysterious, to, a mystery to many of us. That has not happened. And and therefore, what, what has happened is that the ANC uh, has internal strife. Uh, and it's often these days not anymore the ideological. Uh, there's some ideology at the at the economic level, but it's mostly about materialism, uh, positions, money, who can steal more, who can be involved in corrupt ne- networks, uh, and and that hasn't hasn't stopped. And in a sense, although the macro uh, uh, state capture of a Jacob Zuma era has to some extent subsided, it's been replaced or even been supplemented by an endemic. Uh, corruption in in the civil service uh, and in, in and many uh, and many provinces uh, and obviously local governments and therefore I've I've uh, been quite vocal about this. I actually wrote an article in 2020 where I asked the question: Can the ANC self-correct? And I gave a few examples of what is possible if there would be strong leadership, if there would be a lifestyle audits. Uh, if there would be the implementation of the Zona Commission's recommendations, there is that possibility. And and about two months ago, when I re looked at that article, I wrote about it again and I said, well, if that had happened, we might have had a different situation, but today it's even worse. Uh, and therefore, I concluded that the ANC, even if some leaders wanted it, will not be able to correct itself. And, and that goes for government to a large extent, too. So we're in a very bad situation at the moment and the, the reaction of, of uh, the governing party to, to many things uh, come down to two, two basic things. The one is more centralization and control, even though they don't have the ability and the competence to control anything. And secondly, more racial transformation uh, because their policies had failed and they want to now force the minorities out of, out of their uh, positions. And I think that's that's why it, it will not be able to create itself, and that's why we, I, I think that it's time for for political change. But if you look at the electorate, they tend to always vote for the ANC. These problems have been coming for thirty years. Some of them, you know, especially after the Zuma era. Do you really expect the electorate to now turn away from the ANC? Well, obviously, it remains to be seen at the at the polling booths uh, in twenty twenty four. I think if you if you read. Not only the formal media, but also social media. I think we can see a, a realization amongst Black South Africans that the ANC has not been able to do what it, it had promised, promised, and 
and it, it's it's gone the other way almost. Um, service delivery is, is non-existent, uh, and I think the the sort of most visible and tangible um, proof of that is that we're back at stage six load shedding. Um, now, for some re- for some time, the Minister of Electricity said that we'll see the end of load shedding soon. Um, I never believed that because the system is the problem and the system won't be rectified quickly. And so I think the ANC, every time um, we have load shedding and we lose productivity and Transnet is not transporting stuff um, and the economy is struggling, most South Africans, even those at the lower levels of education, will understand this is the ANC's fault. So... I hope, uh, I, I do think that there is still what someone called the gogo effect, that some ANC middle-aged people wouldn't vote for anyone else because they would think that their gogo or their mother or grandmother would be would be uh, disappointed. But I think a younger generation uh, is more and more saying, look, uh, we didn't uh, sign up for this, uh, we won't change. Um, I had a discussion the other day with the young uh, black leader of an NGO and he said, we know who's responsible. You don't need to tell us who's responsible. We know exactly that the ANC is responsible for the mess we're in. So I think there's, there's hope uh, that uh, the electorate will, even though the ANC still has a stranglehold on many institutions, I think you know uh, we've seen it in, in business, we've seen it in the churches, I think slowly but surely it's going to, to, to go the other way. And it might not be that we have a, you know, a victory for the opposition in in this twenty twenty four elections, but I do think that that we will make progress. And uh, so, so what I and obviously this is conjecture on my side, and it's sort of a gut feeling, as as the scenarios always are. My sense is that the ANC will b- get between forty eight and fifty two percent of the vote uh, in in twenty twenty nine, uh, and that it would, if it gets less than fifty percent, it will form a coalition with the smaller parties, um, the hangers-on or the rats and mice in Parliament, the al of the world, good and so on, um, and that uh, it will keep on staggering from disaster to disaster because it, it doesn't have the capacity to govern better. Uh, because of that, and because the ANC is, is a rural-based party more and more, if they do get 48%, it will mean that the two urban areas uh, urban regions, Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, could very much, very well go to the to to an opposition, uh, possibly a DA or a, a multi-party uh, a charter opposition in Gauteng, and and a KZN. It could be an IFP opposition. Um, so that would be the first phase of of what I call a three-phase transition. Uh, the second phase would be that a mere two years after that, we'll have the local government elections. And because the ANC would have lost patronage of provincial government and money and tenders and corruption in Gauteng and Kozil and Natal, the chances are very good that Johannesburg, Pretoria, Ikurulini and Itikbini Durban would be, be, go decisively to the opposition. And that would be the second phase of the transition. And then the third phase would be the ANC falling below 35% over 2029 elections and it will be relegated as its cousins on a PF to a, to a rural-based party. Now, I think this is a more realistic scenario uh, than than the opposition uh, tried uh, getting 51%. But look, let's say that the day of, days of miracles are not yet uh, past. So it, it may be that there's a black, black swan event and it happens. But I think the, uh, the scenario of a three-phase transition is probably more realistic. And what will happen to President Ramaphosa? Because if you look at him, generally people think that he doesn't feel like governing anymore. He's, he seems a bit listless unless there's an international stage that he can shine on like when BRICS happened. Yeah. Look, I, I think you almost got a new lease on life with the old BRICS episode and with the Russia escapade uh, because they, you know, he was in the international limelight. And I think it suits, it suits its, his style better. To be a you know reconciler and 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 be up there, uh, and that's good. I don't I don't don't uh, um, you know uh, want that not to happen to him. But the problem is that nothing has changed on the ground. 
So there are two op- two two scenarios here. Um, the ANC could either get rid of him before the 2024 election and, and let Paul Mashatila run with that. Uh, that would, I think, be a mistake because Ramaphosa has always been more pop- popular than the ANC. Um, and I, I think they will be stupid to do that. On the other hand, if they do badly in the in the opposite uh, in the 2024 election and even if they win by a margin or through a coalition they may get rid of him then uh, as someone must take the blame and then bring us to get in now that would would also be a, a mistake i think but obviously it will be good for the opposition uh, i don't think paul mashatila has the as the expertise or all the or the knowledge to to help a country pick itself up and help the anc to to be a better governing party. So my scenario of the loss of the two provinces and there after some of the metros, I think remains, and it's probably even a stronger uh, a stronger scenario, a stronger possibility than if Ramaphosa stays. Um, the, the, I think the one thing that I uh, that happens to parties, and, and it happened to the National Party, is they, in the last five years of their tenure, they got almost removed from reality and removed from what was happening on the ground. Uh, and 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 one of their ministers who later was a member of ANC said to me, that's exactly what happened to us. What's now happening to Silver Ramaphosa happened to them. And I think it's it's largely to do with the people he surrounded himself with, people who keep him away from reality, tell him what he, they think he would like to know, and he, they don't do him a service. So what is your view about the multi-party charter that opposition parties got together? Um, you said you don't think they're going to win this election. What You've been a conciliator. You've brought parties together. What's your advice to them? What should their next step be? Well, I think they did very well to to bring uh, Professor William Gomeda in as the sort of permanent chair of, of that process. Uh, my information is that he's, he's played a very important role, calming role, with all the egos in the room. Uh, even at the first meeting, uh, I think he also, if not uh, initiated, at least supported the name change from the DA name Moonshot back to the multi-party charter, which I think will make it much easier for other parties to join and also will probably enhance the buy-in and the ownership of all seven of those parties in that process. I must say with him there, I have a bit more confidence that the multi-party uh, charter people could, could do well. I mean, it's also true that some of the smaller parties like the United Independent Movement or ECOSA could probably gain in stature just by being part of that process. So they may get, may get a few votes that they wouldn't have get otherwise. Um, I, however, also feel that uh, if, we, if you look at South African politics, uh, there's basically a, a far left, a left, a center, and not much on the right, really. Um, and and so if you look at the centre, the, 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 there are parties who are part of the centre but who are not part of the multi-party charter. And some of them may join, I think, of, of someone like Musi Mamani or the Patriotic Alliance of the, uh, the Gaten McKenzie. Uh, I think someone like uh, Zungeza Zibi of Ryzen Zanzi would probably not join the charter, uh, although he would agree with most of the principles, but he has a different target audience. Uh, he specifically uh, said in public that he's t- he's f- focusing and targeting disgruntled ANC voters and the youth, the unregistered and the youth who had not yet voted. And, and, and that's a different pool of voters than that the charter would go for. And I, would, I think that's actually a good thing. Uh, but I do think that whatever happens uh, in the 2024 election, that, that Reisman Zanzi uh, Bosa of the Muslim Amani and the PA of Great McKenzie are part of the center. Obviously, there are also individual ANC members who are part of the center, but they, they can't cross the Rubicon yet, so they may do it later. And then you've got the, the left of the ANC and the EFF and PAC and so on uh, on the far left ideologically. And I, and I think that the multi party charter has started a process to build the center. That's the first point. And secondly, that if they play their cards right and they're wise uh, and not alienate uh, other parties outside the charter but inside the center like the PA or like uh, uh, Reis Mzanzi, uh, that the opposition parties, excluding the EFF and the, and the rats and mice, 
in CRATS and mice in Parliament could get close to 40% in, in, in 2024. And I don't think that's, that's wishful thinking. That's, that's a real possibility. Now, if that happens, uh, it will be a great signal to South Africans generally, uh, and it will be the first phase of the transition. And if that happens, probably then that means automatically that Gauteng and Kwasin itself could go to the to the multi-party charter or to uh, to to uh, different coalitions, which means your first phase of the transition would have happened. Um, obviously, I know that the party, the, the charter parties, must tell their supporters we're going for a win, we're, we're going for a bust, you know, forty fifty one percent. Um, and I think their their supporters expect nothing less. But looking at it objectively, as it, as things stand now, that that would be highly unlikely. And I think, in a certain sense. I made a point in a recent article that perhaps for the country, a three-phase transition is not not a bad one, because let's say the ANC gets thirty-two percent of the vote, and even with the EFF possibility of a coalition, they can't get to even forty-five percent. There may be members of the ANC who would refuse to accept this outcome, and it could lead to political instability and even violence. So a slower transition could probably be better for the country. Now, there are people saying we can't afford another five years. I, I'm not part of the Almogedon sort of theory that at some point a country is so bad that it's gone. I think we're far, far from that. Things are bad, but another five years won't kill us. And if we can get a peaceful transition as we had in 94, through that uh, sort of phased transition, I think it's a good thing. So to, to answer your question, I think the multi-party charter started the process of possible opposition coalitions and other centrist parties that could get rid of the ANC by 2029. Do you think enough is being done from civil society to bring about transformation in the country? You've got various movements getting together now in this something that almost resembles the UDF. Is enough being done? Are religious leaders doing enough? Is business doing enough? Uh, on, on average, I don't think so. Uh, let, let me take you back when in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, an organization that I was part of, a consultative business movement, tried to form a movement of business leaders, initially companies, to just be in dialogue with between business community and, and, the, and, and all the um, opposition parties or the, or the uh, uh, mass democratic movement at the time. And companies were generally too afraid to stick out their necks for that. And so what we did is we, we actually asked 40 individual business leaders, sometimes with the knowledge of their companies and sometimes not even with that, to form the CBM. And, and the CBM became a very, uh, very successful organization in helping to facilitate that change. We, we were the secretary to the peace process. We were the secretary at Kudesa and the administration of the multi-party process. But at that time, the national party government was too strong and business people, would, companies were just too scared. Exactly the same thing happens today. Many companies are too scared to, to uh, in, in public, oppose the ANC. Um, they would rather try to help uh, the government than they say they help the country, and perhaps they do. Uh, but I don't believe it's going to work because what I said in the beginning about the ANC being incapable of doing things, incompetent, where those great plans are being thought out at, on the ground, there's neither the willingness nor the, nor the capacity to carry out those plans. So I don't think business is doing enough. They would say that they're doing that, but I don't think that's enough. Uh, the churches, we find the same, that church leaders, perhaps with the exception of some, uh, are very hesitant, and they use the same thing that the churches in the 1980s, 90s used. We don't want to become politically involved. Now, whether one likes it or not, the country is in trouble, and I think the churches should make should 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 take a stand. And there are some church leaders who look at this. NGOs are slightly more independent, not as dependent on government for funding, so they come out, but they're not really coordinated. Unions, you know, you've got. Um, you've got Kusat who's still siding with uh, with the ANC. Seftu of Zima Dhabi recently helped uh, join the EFF in their protest. Um, and, and so you basically got Fedusa and Solidarity, who, who may be part of this 
uh, and, and, and they may, may play a role. And then you've got academics and you've got professional people. I believe if, 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 if the chartered process as well as the opposition parties like Verizon, Zanzi and, and Borsa would show some traction that those type of people will come together because there are many organization initiatives. I think the weakness is that they all working separately. And, and my sense is that if one could get a meeting of all those initiatives together and say, let's form a kind of federation, then you're close to the UDF. Uh, not not, not as, as, as substantial as the UDF, but it's a different time. Uh, the problem with some of these organizations, however, and, and uh, uh, some Geza Zibi at, at one meeting said it well, uh, I won't mention the name of the organization, but one of these who will fall, was formed in, in sort of reaction to the Zuma debacle, he said the problem with this organization is that the minority of those people want to defend our democracy at all costs against them ever. The majority of organizations there want to defend our democracy as long as the ANC stays in power. And they haven't realized that the ANC is the problem with our democracy. And I hope that this phase transition will also give them the perspective and the light that, that that's the problem is that we must cross the ANC Rubicon. They've had their chance. They, there is an organization uh, is is on the downfall and it won't turn around. Jens Eloff, thanks so much for speaking to me. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Linda.